Uh, I'm Ben Samstein. I am uh, one of the transplant surgeons and the chief of uh, liver transplant here. Um, Jenna, do you have the slides? Um, I think I do, yes. I, I will see if I can pull them up right now. I okay. sent them in an email to you if you would like to have control on Monday. Yeah, you want me yeah to I just want to make sure that, uh, sorry, I was running. I was having a meeting. No, okay. Um, Let me resend them real quick to you. No, I'm sure I have them. Here they are. I got them. I got them. Okay. Let's just make sure. This is uh, two days ago, so pulling up yeah. the right ones. Okay, so I am going to share my screen. Um, so this is on living donation, but if we at the end, if we want to ask questions about anything about liver transplant, please feel free. Um, okay, can you see the slides? I'm, I'm, yeah. Uh, I'm gonna, hold on a second. I mean, I'm going to stop sharing again. Okay. Okay, um, i switch to slide via show. Okay, so um, this talk particularly is about living donation because a lot of what we talk about in, in liver transplantation is we determine that you need a liver transplant, um, which unlike many therapies, um, uh, you know, once a doctor decides that you need antibiotics or a medicine or chemotherapy, um, the prescription and the doing of the treatment is often nearly instantaneous. Whereas liver transplant, how you access that treatment, meaning transplant, is a lot of the um, kind of process of the treatment. Um, it's not just you need a liver transplant, it's how you get one. And so um, our program has now for more than 20 years been doing living donor because we recognize that they're just, um, that deceased donation um, is inadequate for many of the patients who we were have been listing. So uh, today we're going to talk about who can benefit from living liver donation, who, who, the, who can be a liver donor, what the evaluation for the donor is like, what, the, what life after donation looks like, uh, both long-term and short-term. So as I mentioned about uh, there just aren't enough livers. There's somewhere between 12 and 16,000 people on the list for liver transplant and somewhere around 3,000 people are either removed from the list or die before liver transplant. And so living liver donation aims to uh, tackle uh, the, both the people who uh, die or get sick, as well as the people who are waiting for land transplant and neither die nor get too sick, but whose lives would be significantly improved um, by having a liver transplant. Um, about 5 to 10 percent, 1 in 20 to 1 in 10 uh, transplants in the United States are performed with a living donor. Um, even though one could make the argument that um, a lot of people on the list would benefit from living donation. Um, so then it's a, why, why aren't more people doing living donor? Um, and the reason is predominantly it's a really hard thing to ask, to ask a family member or a, a family friend um, to, to to undergo a major surgery um, is challenging. Um, so recipients feeling hesitant to ask is hard. Um, sometimes people have been told that their MELD score is low and that that's why um, 
they don't need a liver transplant. But um, the reality is that a lot of the symptoms of liver disease, ascites, swelling, encephalopathy, brain dysfunction, or uh, are not reflected in the MELD score. And so even though someone may have a low MELD, they, it might be determined that a liver transplant would make the quality of their life better, but um, they, they've also been told, well, you don't need a transplant because your MELD is low. So that is confusing guidance can lead people to think that they don't need a living donor. And of course, um, recipient might also be concerned about the risk to the donors. So um, none of the uh, most common complications of liver disease, ascites, encephalopathy, or infection are reflected in the MELD score. And in fact, the average uh, MELD score for a live donor liver transplant is about 15. Um, in fact, we think that the best time to transplant people, um, in other words, the time when they, um, when they would derive the most benefit um, is way before they would have the ability to get a deceased donor. In the United States, um, the average MELD score that people are getting transplanted with a deceased donor is somewhere around 28 to 30. Um, and in fact, probably the best time to be transplanted is somewhere around a MELD score of 8 to 19, depending on your age and other medical conditions. So um, certainly, um, waiting until patients have a MELD score of, of 28, while it makes the best use perhaps of the livers, it isn't necessarily the best treatment for the patient. And as from the patient perspective, ideally when someone has a MELD score between eight and you know, 17, 18, that's when we would be doing the transplant not waiting for them to get sick. Um, questions before I talk about living donation and who can be a living donor? I'm gonna unmute everyone so you can ask questions. Is there a limit to how many times you can be a donor? Yes, you can only be a donor, a liver donor once. Gotcha. I forgot. To, I Go ahead. Mel number. How do I find that out? Sorry, we couldn't fully hear you. I don't remember my Mel number. I don't know where it is. How do I find out? Um, so you could probably send a message to. Um, you know, your waitlist coordinator or your, um, uh, your um, nurse practitioner PA, they can tell you. So there's two parts of your MELD number, by the way. So one is, so if, for example, you have cancer, you can get a MELD score that is separate from your score based on, um, the, your blood tests. So the most common way we calculate a MELD score is by looking at someone's sodium, their bilirubin, their creatinine, and their INR, their clotting factors. And that usually gives somebody a MELD score. But the second way that they can get a MELD score is if they have a tumor or other ways kind of, of getting extra points. I. I say it, emphasize the word extra because it's really not extra. It's whichever is higher. In other words, if you're, the points from your tumor are 25 points and, you're, and the blood score test is 26 points, then you get 26 points because that's higher than 25. Likewise, if your tumor points were 28 and your blood count score was 12, 
your it's whichever is higher. And um, anyway, any other questions about meld or access? Okay. I will keep going. All right, so who could be a living donor? Um, you know, okay, so who can be a living donor? So um, living donors have to be healthy. They have to be in good, uh, they have to be between the ages we, we now accept donors uh, between 18 and 60 and uh, they have to be over 18 and under 60, so 59 and 364 days. Um, they can't have diabetes, they can't have any liver disease, they have to have a blood type that's compatible with the recipient, and they have to have an altruistic motivation for donating, which basically means they can't be being paid. Uh, it's a federal crime to uh, accept money for uh, organs. Um, most of them come from family friends or uh, relatives. Um, we do have a few donors who uh, are altruistic donors or donors who donate anonymously. Um, most of those people choose to donate to children. Nothing wrong with adults, we love them all, but the, many of the donors uh, choose to donate to children. Um, for a living donor, they, um, the living donor, much like a recipient, and you all are familiar with this process, um, you meet with a nurse educator, you meet with a hep they meet with a hepatologist, a surgeon, an independent doctor, a social worker, a psychiatrist, they have an MRI and they have blood tests. It's a little condensed compared to the recipient evaluation, but it's meant to be thorough to inform them and to be safe. That's the most important. Um, the goal of, of the evaluation is to educate the in donor, make sure that they're making an informed decision. Just as you know, you'll, you know, a lot of your process is about making an informed decision about transplantation. Uh, what do we know about LDLT? Um, the donation is a real operation with real risks about the risk of death is somewhere around one in a thousand to one in 2000. So it's not high, but it's not zero. Um, donors can have complications, including a bio leak. They can develop a, a hernia and they can have pain or they will have pain. The vast majority of donors have no complication at all. Um, there's a, a incidence of bio leak that's about one in 20, hernia about one in 10, about one in 50 people require a blood transfusion, and we've performed over 400 donors and no, no, no one has died, but it is, it's certainly possible. The average donor stays in the hospital uh, three to six days. Um, the uh, Average recovery time is about six weeks, um, with 50% returning to work in four weeks and about 75% um, in eight weeks and nearly 100% by 12 weeks. Really depends on what the donor's job is. Today, I met a donor who was in construction, who's 56. I told him you should really expect 12 weeks because you have a physical job and you're older. That's different than a 25-year-old person who works a desk job. They're gonna have different recovery times to work. Um, most of the time um, we uh, are choosing, we, there's two sides of the liver. Um, the right lobe of the liver has about 40, 60% of the mass. The left lobe has 40%. So if the donor is much bigger than the recipient and the person receiving the liver, um, then we might use the left lobe, which is a smaller portion. If the donor um, is about the same size or smaller, then we'll use the right lobe. 
Um, we do laparoscopy in a portion of the donors, depending uh, on the anatomy of the donor. Um, most of the donors who are donating to children are done laparoscopically, but uh, those donors who are donating to adults, uh, about half of them. Lapar laparoscopy, here's a picture of laparoscopy. So um, where the liver portion has to be taken out. So we do have to take out the entire piece of liver safely so that we can implant it into the recipient. Um, and so we make an incision and we do it on the lower abdomen because it, it hurts less and they, it helps them recover faster. So they, we do the incision dividing through the liver with five holes in the upper abdomen. This is what it looks like. Um, it's not a picture of me, my abdomen. Um, uh, afterwards, um, this donor, for example, was a, a trapeze instructor, in fact. Um, so uh, his abdominal muscles were very critical to his job. Um, most of the donors who have uh, a partially laparoscopic, we have an incision in the, in the midline uh, between the ribs. Um, you can see there is an incision. Um, it's, there's the, we don't do the extraction here, we do the extraction right here. Um, this contrasts to the recipient incision, which is usually either across the abdomen and an up and down, or what we call a hockey stick, which is across and up and down. Um, you know, I think what's most important is, you know, one of the things that we spend a fair amount of time in this program talking to people about is, I'm a big believer that, um, that transplant is about getting an organ. It's not about being on the list. Um, if, if we determine, we meaning the team yourself, determine that transplant is what's best for you, then engaging you in the process about how you get transplanted is critical. Rather than just saying, well, you're on the list and one day your number may or may not come up. And living donation is a way of expediting it. Um, we also talk to people about a variety of different ways in which they get tr could get transplanted. Um, and I think it's important, I'm happy to take some questions now, but it's also important that you talk to your team, your surgeon, your hepatologist, your NP, how am I gonna get transplanted? What can I expect? Um, and that's a lot about, um, you know, what's the right decision and pathway for you? How sick are you? Um, how, you know, um, how much is liver disease affecting the quality uh, of your life? I think that's my last slide. Oh, if you want more information about living donation, um, so you can call our living donor specialists, um, Jenica Kim and Darby <laughs> Santamore. There's also a bunch of websites and we can um, ask, answer more questions that donors might specifically have. Um, we also, but just so you know, um, donors can do blood tests and ha have their blood type checked um, uh, and no, you know, without any cost, the center takes care of that. And uh, a more, the, the evaluation is covered by the recipient's insurance. So the donors, the donors don't have to pay anything. There can be costs related to donation. So there's uh, loss of wages. Um, are, are can be a real cost. And although New York State allows people to de de deduct lost wages from their taxes, if a donor is coming from outside New York State, they may not be able to recoup lost wages. There may be other costs, travel costs, um, some of which can be recruit, recouped through a National Living Donor Assistance Fund, but it's, you know, requires some additional paperwork. And that is my last slide. Any questions? 
I unmuted everybody. So if you have questions, now's the time. So I want to go ahead. I remember someone telling me when I first got the email done that, that um, e even if you wanted, say, a family member to go in, it was up to them to tell to, to tell us if they had gone in at all or had said yes or no or for whatever reasons. You, you wouldn't tell if they came in or something. Right. So one of the things that... Um, so we, the, the donors have to contact our center. So what we have, you know, you, you do is you kind of gather the information and then someone on you, you or someone on your behalf shares it with your friends and family. Um, but you're right, you can't kind of um, call for your, you know, I can't call for my brother and say my brother would like to be a donor and I filled out the paperwork for 